All right, welcome everyone to another Hope Talk brought to you by Help Hope Live. This time around, we are joined by two of our wonderful ambassadors. But before I get to them and the bulk of the Hope Talk, I wanna just go over some, some maintenance, some, some business that we have is that just to remind everyone that Help Hope Live is a national organization that helps individuals fundraise for all of their out-of-pocket medical expenses and related costs. So we are here to help you live your lives a little bit easier. So please reach out, let us know if you could use us for anything that you might need or anyone in your family or friends. Beyond that, for this talk in general, we are using the captions today. So they may, they are automatically generated so they might not be 100% correct, but they're doing a great job. So in case anyone needs those, they are at the bottom of your screen. And uh, there will be a this will be recorded. So this will go out to everyone who has registered. It will also live on our YouTube page. And for anyone who has questions, there is the Q&A section where you can leave your question. And then we'll also have our chat function ready so you guys can chat about anything that's going on in the conversation. <clears throat> But let me get started without further ado and introduce these two fine gentlemen that you see on your screen. Our first panelist is one of our Help Hope Live ambassadors, Dylan Mortimer. Dylan graduated with a BFA from Kansas City Art Institute and an MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York. He has created public art installations in several cities across the US from New York to LA and has been featured in the New York Times, the New York Post, Chicago Sun, the Baltimore Sun, and so many more publications. Dylan was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at three months old in 1979 and received new lungs on January 18th, 2017 and April 13th, 2019. He and his wife, Shannon, have been married for 16 years and have two boys who are 12 and 10. And certainly without needing any other introduction, especially in the cystic fibrosis world, our second panelist is another Help Hope Live ambassador, Jerry Cahill. And if we had one word to choose to describe Jerry, it would be relentless. At 67 years old, Jerry Cahill has overcome what seems to be insurmountable odds, including a double lung transplant in 2012, and nine years later, a simultaneous liver and kidney transplant. Three transplants for any human would be remarkable. Three transplants for someone who has lived with cystic fibrosis his entire life is an absolute phenomenon. With everything he, Jerry does day in and day out with his work with the Boomer Esiason Foundation, his work with Help Hope Live and so many other advocacy organizations, his most important work is to honor his donors and their families. I am also proud to say that this spring marks the 20th anniversary of Jerry working with Help Hope Live. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. With all of that said, and with your esteemed introductions, could you guys, let's hear a little bit from your voice. Introduce yourselves and your work in the community. I know you both, as we said, Jerry is very relentless in his work and advocacy. And Dylan, we can see your, your artwork behind you, your advocacy, that is how you get your word out. So you're both well known in the community. Can you speak a little bit about that? And even how you guys both came to meet each other because this relationship that we're seeing on screen goes back quite some time. Yeah, um, I, I can go first if you don't mind, Jerry, because I, I think yeah, we met, ahead. Uh, I think we met, it was uh, 2004, I think, and um, in New York City, and I, I got a scholarship for when I was in grad school, uh, and you did it, you had started doing podcasts there, and, and we did a podcast, and uh uh, and and that started. It's just kind of been a um, you know a gosh a twenty year relationship. Uh, now you know that back even then before social media before you know uh, things being the way they are now. Um, I don't know that maybe I had met one other person with CF. You know, like I just oh wow you know like I I didn't have really contact with. I certainly heard of other people, but I just didn't. Um, 
and and so so yeah we did the podcast and then we've collaborated in a variety of different ways since uh but i i would uh join all those wonderful words about you and say you've been an inspiration to me i, I hope i've told you this face to face but you've been an inspiration to me for a long time and really an ambassador of hope as we're talking about hope today um, good job don i see what you did there yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh you know because i don't for sure i it, not even just me in person uh at that time i think you were late 30s but but as you you know uh, as you're in your 40s i had never known of another person in their 40s with cf i mean i just had never even knew you know and uh so yeah i was i was born in 79 the average lifespan was like 14 to 17 so 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 these kind of things like right opening your mind to to hope like capacity for hope that there could even be uh, a future to think about and dream for um is huge so so you've been a, a huge part of that jerry um so so thank you we'll start off with that <laughs> wow well thank you for those uh kind words um yeah. so yeah i kind of grew up in the apparel industry and i went to the university of connecticut uh was involved in sports uh have four brothers and a sister so growing up with cystic fibrosis um you know, I learned to be very independent within my family. There were so many of us running around. Um, and once I got involved in sports, I just never thought much about cystic fibrosis. I just thought I was an athlete, but I wasn't very good in most sports. Um, yeah, I went to college. I competed. I did track. I never was really that sick. Uh, once they diagnosed me at age 11, uh, I went into the hospital for the first time after I got out of college, started working full time, wasn't exercising as much. Uh, once you start to go in the hospital, it's it's like uh, an endless vicious cycle that doesn't end. Um, worked in the, had a career, worked in the apparel industry. Uh, then over time, you know, my cystic fibrosis progressed um after a great career and one that would have continued um i needed to go out on disability to get the double lung transplant once you have a double lung transplant you know it was difficult for me to go back to what i used to do uh because i used to travel 70 percent of the time and uh to be honest with you uh once i went out on uh disability i ran into somebody about mentioning the foundation so I started volunteering here, but I remember when I first started, I didn't know anything about the world of CF. I mean, I know I had it, I took care of myself, but there was a whole world out there of people and whatnot. So when I started volunteering at the Boomer Esiason Foundation, which was great and Boomer gave me the opportunity, uh, it was a safe haven for me. I created a lot of programs for the CF community, podcasts and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and that's how I started uh, getting involved. And that's how I met uh, Dylan Yeah, through uh, a podcast. And yeah. Um, yeah, we've been friends ever since. That's awesome. And just the way that I'm sure that, Jerry, you certainly have helped Dylan, and I'm sure that you've helped so many other people, because I know that's part of your mm -hmm. advocacy work. We've had other clients that I know that you've had firsthand experience with and their families. So on their yeah. behalf, I say thank you as well. Um, yeah. Now, I know both of you, as you mentioned, both of you have had multiple transplants outside of, I mean, multiple transplants, I would say, I guess, caused by your cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dylan, I know we had talked about your your donor story. Preparing yeah. the donor is a pretty unique story, if you want to share that. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Jerry was right there with me. I mean, I was in New York. Uh, we had just moved back there, my whole my family, uh, my wife and kids, and um, my first um, my first appointment at, at Columbia University. They said you're probably looking at a second double lung transplant because there was, uh, you know, antibodies in in the donor lungs that were not in my lungs, and that was causing problems. And so, so my lung function went from 95% in June to 10% in November. And so is it really sharp? So, you know, from I can run five or six miles to I can't get up a flight of stairs. And 
uh, in New York City, there's a lot of stairs, as, as we all know. So, um, so they listed me, but because of those antibody issues, I'm, they're screening out 71% of anybody that's a match to me. So whatever small percentage uh, of people is a match to you, I'm screening out 71% of those. So Columbia was very clear about you will not be transplanted here. You need to go uh, to Duke. That's the only uh, chance that you have. Uh, for a variety of reasons, they, they thought I would have a, uh, at least a shot at, at Duke. Um, and so we, you know, had an evaluation scheduled there to see if Duke would take me. And, and a week before that, uh, a few days before that, I get a call out of the blue from this woman who had followed me on Instagram, uh, a friend of a friend, and just had followed my story. And she was a nurse and she uh, lived in Kansas City and she knew uh, that I was on the transplant list. And her cousin had just passed away. So she said, my cousin just passed away. My family's talked. We all want to donate his lungs to you. And I said, um, that's really sweet of you. You know, that's really kind. Thanks for thinking of me. I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, that's not how this works. There's a list and there's a protocol and there's a, you know, and she said, we'll, we'll try. And I, and I said, well, thanks. You know, thanks so much. It's really sweet. And we hung up and I never thought about it again. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell my kids. I didn't, you know, none of that. I just, uh, not once in my mind, did I think like, what if this is a maybe positive, just because the odds were so far less than 1% that this would actually be a match to me. I mean, it's, it, it's just insane to think about. But the next day, doctor from Columbia called and said, this woman called and has lungs for you. And I said, first of all, um, you can do that. And, and she goes, well, I've never heard of it before, but apparently, yes, you can do that. And I said, and it's a match to me. And, and long story short, it was, it had a couple of the antibodies that, that they're trying to screen, but not the main one. And, and anyway, so they flew a doctor from New York to Kansas City, the lungs look good. He flew back with them and um, yeah, called me up. I, I got it to hospital by uh, uh, one in the morning and then by five, they knew it was a go and they took me back. And seven hours later, I woke up again from, from a second transplant. And uh, that was four years ago. And I mean, it's, it's just unreal. <clears throat> It's just, a, it's an unreal story. And so, so humbling to receive the gift like that as Jerry well knows, uh, we are just so grateful to be alive. And what was your first transplant experience like? If this one well, clearly was yeah, so unique. The, um, it, it, it was really, if, I mean, after recovery, after a few months of recovery, I felt the best I had ever felt in my life for about a year and a half. And so it was really at that, they knew about the antibody issues right away, but it didn't really manifest till about a year and a half. So, so for that year, I mean, yeah, I was, you know, uh, you know, my poor family, I wanted to climb every mountain and, and ride every ride and, you know, uh, do every run and everything. So, you know, they had to calm me down, but um, and so, so the second transplant I had a little more practice, but I, uh, I still, you know, I, I'm working hard to not wear them out too much. So <laughs> definitely, I'm sure. So, yeah, and yeah. Jerry, I know you, you, we talked about in your intro that with all the work that you do, your life's work truly is honoring your donors. What has mm. your transplant experience been like? Have you had any contact with your donors or what has that been like? Yeah, my uh, transplant experience was, um, you know, after I fought and fought and fought and thought I could exercise and that would kind of keep pushing off the transplant. It got to the point of no return. My lung function was lower than it was between 18 and 20, depending on the day. Um, so it, it was time. Um, I had five dry runs uh, and then I, I received the, the gift on the sixth. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was obviously life changing. Um, and then they received the transplant at the time I was working uh, and volunteering at the Boomer Esiason Foundation. So I continued to do that um, and just giving back. I mean, I thought, uh, you know, that was my purpose and, you know, it wasn't for me and just to give back what I've learned in life. So I just started giving back and doing more within the CF community. Um, and I honor my donor every day by staying active um, I think, you know, anybody with cystic fibrosis or any ailment, it doesn't matter, you know, it's all about your body, your mind and spirit. And just to take medicine isn't the only answer, you know, you've got to get out there and, you know, move, you know, move your body. 
And I always wanted more life. So I, you know, I don't like being sick. So anything I could do to stay active, I would do. Um, you know, over time, you know, there's uh, obviously issues, as they say, you trade one disease for the other. Uh, and unbeknownst to me, then I started having, uh, at the time, I guess it was three years ago, I started having liver issues. And one thing led to the other. I mean, your heart and your lungs work together, your liver and your kidneys. I was doing a bike to breathe, raising, you know, funds for cystic fibrosis. And as I was doing this, and I really probably shouldn't have been doing it, I was just getting sicker. I gained like 30 pounds in water weight. Uh, my kidneys were shutting down. Uh, we finished the bike tour, the bike to breathe event. Uh, and I was doing it with Emily Schaller, uh, another friend of mine and um, who has cystic fibrosis. We finished the th event early, we sped it up and uh, they dropped me off at the hospital. I thought I was going in for a routine you know, watch to, for them to monitor me with the um, diuretics to, you know, get rid of the water. Uh, and during that time, my kidneys really started to shut down. And when you have liver and kidney issues, you just get a little delirious. Uh, and I remember at one point, uh, oh, and the funny part about it, the theme for the, the bike tour. Something funny here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of funny. So, you know, we did it and we were doing it during my, when I turned 65. So there's a song called Born to be Alive, at, you know, Born to be Alive. Uh, and it's an old song. So I thought, oh, this is a great theme. So we call the bike theme Born to be Alive at 65. Well, my 65th birthday, I spent in the hospital <laughs> right <laughs> after the bike to breathe. And I was, I was really kind of dying, to be honest with you. Uh, and I ended up going, I remember them moving me and I said, why are you moving me? And they said, oh, you'll have better care. And they moved me to the intensive care. But I remember just blanking out and shutting down. And I woke up two days later on dialysis 24 seven. I, I don't even know how I got there. So this is one of those funny things anything. after you've made it through it. <laughs> well, yeah. And it just got a little funnier though, too. I remember waking up. And then they're like, oh, Mr. Cahill, um, unfortunately now you need a liver and a kidney and huh. you're, not going, you're not going anywhere until you have a donor. And we can't activate you now because you have a fever and until the fever goes away, you know, that's, you, you're, we can't activate you, but you're not going home. And how long will that be? I asked and they said it could be months and months. Uh. And, uh, but I was, I was really pretty sick. I mean, I was glued to dialysis. Uh, then it, it got a little better. But I remember talking to the doctor, like you're saying, this is ridiculous. You know, we have to, you've got to activate me. Um, and they were fighting back and forth about if they were going to do it. And I remember saying to the doctor one day, this is, this is ridiculous. And the doctor said, Mr. Cahill, I don't think you understand how sick you are. Mm. I said, it can't be that bad. And they said, yeah, your MEL score is 39 out of 40, which is a indicator. And a friend of mine had a liver transplant who was healthy. And I asked him about this, you know, way before I was in the hospital. And he said, oh, his MEL score was at 37. And he was like in and out of a coma. Wow. They said, and they said to me, we don't even understand how you're awake and talking to us. Mm. So anyway, but the irony of the whole thing or the blessing is that when they finally decided to activate me, when the fever was gone, they said to me that morning, okay, we're gonna activate you. That afternoon at two o'clock, the same day, the physician's assistant came in and said, oh, Mr. Cahill, we have a donor. And I was just so, I just didn't get it. I mean, cause I waited so long for lungs. I said, you have a donor for what? <laughs> and they said for your liver and kidney and they said it's going to happen quick the donor is in a hospital in new york he's not at columbia uh but you're getting your lung your liver and kidney tonight and it was during covid so nobody could come and to be honest right. with you uh i found out later they gave me like a 20 percent chance of getting through it 
because of having another, and I wasn't strong. The surgery was 16 hours, 43 minutes. So, but here I am, I'm back. Wow. You are, exactly. I remember Amazing. getting either an email or a phone call from you not too far after your transplant and being stunned at how well you were doing. So wow. you yeah. definitely are a testament yeah. to the yeah. thriving portion of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. I've been blessed. And Dylan said a lot of prayers for me too. So yeah. that was oh, very yeah. kind of <laughs> I want to mention something. I want to kind of branch off maybe appropriately into something that Jerry mentioned about maintaining the, the life balance and the health balance. And as I mentioned the branches and I see both of you in front of beautiful pieces of artwork, mm -hmm. Dylan, can you talk a little bit about your artwork and how you yeah. maintain your life health balance? And as Jerry said, even maintaining your health is so important, but health encompasses a lot of different aspects of life. Sure, so what, sure. Talk a little bit about these beautiful pieces of art we see right now. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I am an artist. That's that's how I'm trained and kind of what I've done my whole life. And it's kind of my way really to talk about these things because they, they can tend to be too much for words. So I create things like this. And this one behind us was really just my vision of a healthy bronchial tree before I was transplanted the first time of just just kind of, uh, you know, speaking visually into reality what I wanted to see a bronchial tree that was all shiny and healthy and kind of stained glass looking colors just to, uh, transformed from a from an ugly decaying dying bronchial tree so so i make uh, collages a lot of sculpture but a lot of uh, cut paper collages around this topic so a lot of symbols that are are really just about transforming things that have been traumatic to us um you know hospital beds iv poles ambulance doors i mean you know a variety of symbols and transforming them to be glorious and and hopeful you know so um so so artwork uh in addition to telling the story has been really healing for me and, and many others as i know but uh when i was there in new york at, on 10 percent lung function i still would find myself kind of like like crawling into the studio uh, to create because it just kept my spirit alive at that at that point you know so many times in my life I mean I've often uh, drawn and collage and such there in the hospital room and sometimes even brought glitter in the hospital room I use a lot a lot of glitter uh, as this kind of like over the top shiny hopeful transformation of uh, previously said objects to, as a way to kind of make them shiny and glorious that's what it feels to me uh, to speak to the reality of like we were on death's door so many times and yet we're alive it's it's uh it's traumatic it's it's very difficult and challenging i wish it on nobody any of these things but uh but to to receive gifts like this is is so glorious beyond um anything we could describe it's humbling we can never repay it and that's exactly the point you know like we we receive this life and we go forward uh and, and do the things that we do out of that gratitude, you know, we can't, we can't give somebody our lungs back literally. And, and that's kind of how breath works. You know what I mean? Nobody earns it or deserves it. You just, you receive breath and then you go for it and, you know, you do the best that you can and you fight and you hope and you give uh, in the outflow of that. So, so the artwork is, is very much about that. As far as the balance, I mean, yeah, it's it definitely, um, you know, uh, I tr I try as best I can, not not perfectly, but but putting you know, uh, putting health first, putting compliance, exercise, all those kind of things first. I I, I pretty much start out my day uh, like that and, and spend you know a, a, as much time as I can before I kind of get into the rest of what I'm doing. It's just um, uh, you know, uh, as Jerry mentioned before, it's a, a way to honor your donors. It's a way to honor. Uh, all the people who have fought for you, prayed with you, operated on you, um, the the list of people we have to thank is is too far, you know, uh, you know, beyond what we even know. And so again, everything we do is sort of an outflow of that gratitude. So can you maybe go into a little detail because I don't know if everyone who's viewing this might not be familiar with 
you said you start your day that way. What does that look like? What kind of yeah. therapies do you need to do to get your lungs at a place where you can be here talking to us today? For sure. Uh, well, yeah, again, as Jerry mentioned a little bit, like with cystic fibrosis, that was, you know, um, well, towards the end, you know, two, three, four hours of, of breathing treatments, inhaling aerosols and, and uh, antibiotics. And, and that it was a more maintenance in that regard then. Uh, Post-transplant, it does look a little different. And uh, primarily it's, it's, you know, taking pills and there's um, diabetes to contend with. And there's, uh, it, it's less work, uh, at least for me on the front of um, maintaining it or, or compliance in regard to medication, but, but exercise is uh, the same, if not more now, is certainly trying to exercise up to the day I was transplanted each time. But, uh, but post, you know, you just feel better. And so you're able to, you know, after recovery, you're able to, to just do more. And uh, so for me, what it looks like is probably, a, you know, a good two hours a day of, you know, uh, if, you know, running or biking, something like that. And then uh, lifting weights, doing some TRX, you know, some um, uh, simple or not simple uh, exercises just to, to kind of maintain stamina and overall health and, and endurance. So that's what it looks like for me. That's amazing. And to turn to Jerry, someone who doesn't know anything about exercising at all. Uh, um, <laughs> let me, Jerry, you are known for your mantra in the community of you cannot fail. Can you go into that a little bit and your experience in the, uh, your history as an athlete and what you what, you know, what that has brought to you in your life? Yeah. So, um, I got involved, uh, in athletics and mainly because when I was diagnosed at 11, my father thought, well, if Jerry's not gonna be around, he wanted me to spend time with my brothers. And my three older brothers were all athletes and quite good. Um, so I remember, you know, and my father was very friendly with the coaches. And instead of me being on like the little peewee league, my father put me on the team with my brothers because he wanted me to be with my brothers. So, um, you know, and I was a little guy and my brothers were bigger. So I played football and I remember, you know, getting crushed. My father, my brother was a star halfback. So my father said, Jerry's going to be a halfback like his brother. <laughs> and I would watch my brother score touchdown after touchdown. And my father would stand on the hill with a German shepherd, our dog, and all I would do is look at my brother scoring touchdowns and pray that he would stop because I knew that would put me in the game then. And I watched my father because my father would give a little wave to the coach when he wanted me to go in after oh they were gosh. winning by so wow. much. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I went in and played and I got to the point where like I would run the other way on the field away from these big <laughs> monsters. And then I told my father after that, I'm not going to play this game anymore. Finish out the season. Then we went to baseball and I got hit in the eye with the baseball was in oh. the emergency room. Um, so, and then I went to basketball. I thought I was a great basketball player, but I wasn't went to high school the first day you try it out, you know, you show up the next day, look at the sheets and my name wasn't on there. And I kept looking and I said to one other little kid, like, I don't understand, my name's not on the list. He goes, well, you didn't make the team. So I gravitated like everybody does to cross country. Now, I don't know what a kid with cystic fibrosis was doing <laughs> running cross country, but wow. I was, I never told people, I just said- I was gonna oh, say, and the school cold. allowed you to do that? Uh, yeah, well, my doctors, uh, everyone wrote off on it. Yeah, they wrote off on it and they just said, well, whatever. And unbeknownst to me and my family and everybody at the time, exercise was probably the single most important thing that kept me healthy and alive. Why we have um, you here at 67 years old. Yeah. And now, yeah, I'm 67 now, but yeah, I still stay involved in sports. I'm coaching at two high schools. I coach pole vaulters and, um, I love it, but you know, exercise, I think for anybody is, uh, it's great for your body and your mind and uh, it keeps yeah. you healthy and stress-free as much as you can be. Yeah. And where did yeah. you start using or how did you start using that mantra? If you oh, fail? you cannot fail. Well, you cannot fail 
came about because I remember growing up when I was getting sick a lot and, you know, my brothers weren't really, you know, my, my mom in particular would say, you know, don't worry, Jerry, you're not going to fail. You'll be fine. Cause you know, I was like, was very confused about the whole thing why I'm sick all the time. Um, and it became like uh, a mantra to me that, you know, you cannot fail. And my mom used to say, like, you know, don't worry, you're, you're the hero of your own story. It doesn't matter what your brothers do. You know, you're 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 doing fine. So when I was at the foundation, then many years later, um, you know, I was working on programs. And um, so we'd made a T-shirt. You cannot fail. We started doing different programs with it. I did a book, You Cannot Fail. Uh, and the book was really just about words. And I would write a little story about each word. Um, and yeah, it was, you cannot fail. You are the hero of your own story. It doesn't matter, you know, if you get up in the morning and you get up and just, you know, you, you do something in the day for some yeah. people. It's not about running a marathon. If you get up and you walk around the block and feel good about yourself, and that's what you accomplish for that day, well, that's great. You are you are a hero, and you know one step forward, and then the next step leads to more and more steps, and so that's really where it all came from, and it became a lot more popular than I ever thought. Um, but it's good. It's a good mantra. It's a good uh, thing. I mean, listen, everybody. I'm not going to say fail, but everybody falls down and you get back up again. So, you know, there's no failures in life. I mean, there really isn't. I mean, you can, you can reinvent yourself. And I think that's important. Absolutely. And with that, and with your experiences for both you and Dylan in your transplants and your medical journeys, how did that lead you both to help hope live? How did you guys start? Like what turned you to fundraising? And, you know, when was the point that your medical expenses just got so overwhelming or what, what was that journey for you, Dylan? Yeah. Um, you know, I wish I knew about help hope live the first transplant, but I did find out the second transplant and, um, you know, it was immensely helpful to, I mean, yeah, uh, as uh, in case anybody doesn't know that, yeah, the cost, uh, not just medically, but in terms of housing and how you, you know, how you're figuring out transportation and all these things. Um, uh, so I, I did find out about Help Hope Live, the second one, and, and, and was able to uh, raise support through Help Hope Live to, um, uh, again, everybody's experience is different, but, but me for my second journey in transplant with Help Hope Live, it was, uh, <laughs> an entirely different adventure than the first one. Um, and, and yeah, just, just a lot of those uh, practical issues, especially with having a family and juggling lots of different things. It was a lot more doable um, there in the second transplant. Thanks to help hope live. So. Nice. Jerry, tw I mean, you've been with us for 20 years. How did you first hear about us? What made you come work with us? Yeah. So when I was listed for transplant back then, they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they said, well, you know, you need to probably do some fundraising because, you know, there's a lot of incidental expenses that insurance won't pick up. And I think they recommended a couple of uh, uh, organizations. And back then, uh, you guys had a different name, National Transplant Assistance Fund. Yep. So anyway, I had spoken to a couple of organizations and then I remember speaking to you guys at the time and you were all so accommodating and user-friendly that it made things a lot easier for me. And I remember when I started, I took it on as a project for myself because I created these beautiful flyers and had them made and trifolds and then I remember after I did all this because I was in the business world I received this big box of all these flyers and pamphlets that you know I had made and would had the organization and donate and I was like what the heck am I going to do with these like the reality hit me that I had to start fundraising and send them out and it was amazing because 
the support that I got from Help Hope Live with giving banners and pins. And also when speaking to them, they kind of taught me that, listen, you're not the one that's gonna be doing all this. You're gonna get a support staff. And I was amazed at how many of my friends and family, but also long lost friends that got involved and loved taking on the project of fundraising. And it was funny, my, my brother did one once and he was telling me all about it. And I said, oh, that sounds really good. And I remember him saying to me, why are you talking like it's just something that we're doing and it doesn't involve you? And I remember saying to him, well, I'm not going to that. He goes, what do you mean you're not going? It's for you. I said, oh no, I'm too embarrassed because you oh. have to show <laughs> off. Yeah, <laughs> so hey, I good did. point, Jerry. We have this conversation with our clients every day about yeah. being embarrassed and asking for help. So I'm interested to hear that. Right, but it, you know, it, um, it's so important and true. And you just don't realize that people, so many people are willing to help out. And, um, you know, I've been blessed that way. And then after, you know, just recently with my liver and kidney, you know, uh, people I worked with helped out because I was really sick. And I said, well, let's put something together. They helped out, put it together. They came to the hospital, took a picture of me with all the tubes in my neck for dialysis. And it, it's just amazing the amount of love and support that comes in. And it created, it, it, um, it released and got rid of a lot of the stress because it could be very stressful. So that's how I got involved. And, you know, you all have been so supportive and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. We're just not letting you go clearly is what the point there is. You go. There yeah. you go. Um, yeah. And I would be remiss as well to not mention someone that both of you had contact with who was also a Help Hope Live client. Uh, one of our clients, Annie McMahon, who was yeah. in the cystic fibrosis world in yeah. New York. And her family had a phenomenal support system and put on yeah. amazing fundraisers to the point that they knew they had above and beyond what Annie would ever need. And yeah. when Annie unfortunately passed, they did create the Annie McMahon Memorial Fund at Help Hope Live. So we do have grant dollars as well that people are eligible for who are living with cystic fibrosis um, and maybe mm -hmm. need a little mm -hmm. bit of a bump with their campaign funds. So yeah, this the is... McMahon family, they're amazing. They yeah, they are exactly. very amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing to see not only the transplant world, but the cystic fibrosis world, your community gets smaller and smaller and how tight knit everyone is. Mm -hmm. And that is mm -hmm. really important to see because community means so much to what we do and to help you guys live yeah. your life in that maintaining of the health and the balance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah we're a fancy yeah. group there you go <laughs> jerry yeah i i would yeah echo those uh, jerry's thoughts about like it, i think it's hard for everybody sometimes to realize how many people want to help you you know and we're so used to kind of you got to do it on your own and and um and, and i would also agree with um uh, you know, it's changed a lot over time. But yeah, when I grew up with cystic fibrosis, I felt nobody wanted to know about me having CF. I mean, like, I would never bring it up to anybody. I would never, you know, I felt that would just be a, a, a you know, something that people would make fun of me for. I didn't, I, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's obviously not um, in any kind of perfect state now, but there's a, there's definitely more awareness. There's more um, people want to know those kind of things. So, so so that, and then the fact that, you know, when we go through something like an organ transplant, um, people want to help, you know, they, yeah. they really do. And um, a lot of it, I think, is kind of getting over your own ego or pride or whatever to just receive. And that's, that is primarily what you're doing with a, an organ transplant. You know, you're, you're receiving something that you can't give to yourself. And so, um, so Help Hope Live is, is really, um, uh, you know, a, a culmination of the whole process of um, people want to participate in your story and they, they want to support you and they want to. Um, and so, so yeah, we have to get over ourselves and, and receive that. Um, and it's, it's the community that comes out of that is really profound, as you guys have been saying. 
That was beautiful, Dylan. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And as we're edging toward the end of the hour, if anyone who is watching has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A or any comments for Dylan or Jerry um, or any comments or questions about working with Hope Hope Live. But even in general, I mean, as you guys were kind of giving those words of encouragement and advice, um, I think even just from your transplant journey and all of that, like, what would you say to someone who is going through that, whether they're just getting listed or, you know, there's so many different stages and that there's so much, you know, every different stage brings with it its own challenges and its own journeys. Is there yeah. any bits of advice or anything that someone maybe told you that either it worked or it didn't? Was there any bad advice people gave you through the years? Mm. Mm. No, I didn't. I never had any bad advice. I, um, I know a lot of people are afraid of transplant, but for me, my quality of life was so bad at the time. And, you know, I, I enjoy living and doing and being involved with people. So I wanted more life. Uh, yeah, I just wanted more life and I wasn't going to live or I couldn't see myself living the way I was. I mean, it wasn't life. It was, uh, it was existence and it was a terrible existence. So, um, you know, I just said I wanted more life and I wanted to live in the forward of possibilities, whatever they were. And it couldn't be worse than it was at the time. I mean, with the lungs and even with the liver and the kidney, I was, you know, I would go to a track meet and finish the meet and go to my car and I'd fall asleep for hours and wake up like, and, mm. yeah. So mm. yeah, I wanted a better quality life. I wanted more life. And, you know, I think you, you just got to move forward. I mean, that's my mm -hmm. advice. Mm -hmm. That is, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember you mentioning that quote before and it's so, it's so important that live in the forward. It's just such a great idea. I always think when, you know, when someone passes or any of that, people say you'll move on. And I think you're, you'll never move on from those things. You move forward from those things. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah, I think great... it's important because it's also, you know, people talk about a bucket list. I mean, a bucket list is such a, like a negative thing. I mean, you know, I believe that you should have a living list of what you want to do when you're alive yeah. and move forward. A bucket list sounds like, oh God, you're planning your death already. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I, I just would obviously concur, I mean, daring to hope, you know, um, I feel like transplant life or CF life or contending with any major disease or chronic illness is, is kind of like a picture of what, what the whole of life is, you know what I mean, it's kind of, there's, there's parts that are the wor worst than you thought they would be, you know, and yet, parts that you thought you would never get to experience and better than you could possibly have, ima have imagined. And so um, being a person that's going through a transplant or has CF or any of these kind of things is, is in part standing in the tension of, uh, you know, yeah, get, getting honest with yourself about the sadness and the difficulty of it, not trying to lie or cover that over or be in denial, you know, uh, but, but simultaneously holding the, the hope that we have, and, and Jerry and I are both articulating, uh, we could not have imagined that we would grieve, uh, especially like for me, 37 years of, of um, not being able to breathe fully and then breathing fully, it, it's just indescribable to like how you feel after that, you know? So, so it's both and and not either or. And I think, uh, yeah, the, the courage to, to hope uh, for more than than you could imagine, even you know, is a is a big deal. Um, I think kind of fighting any disease because it's uh, it's hard, you know. And there will be times you want to give up, and that is totally understandable. And we've all felt that. Uh, but but having the the courage and the um, you know the stamina to to kind of take another step. Um, you don't know what what hope is going to be around the corner, and and there are again so many people that that want to help you and, and want to join you in your fight, despite what you might think, despite what you might feel at the time, you might feel very alone. And, and that's real. But there are people out there that want to help. There are people out there uh, rooting for you. And so so again, just kind of having the faith, the hope, the whatever to um, uh, to to receive what is out there for you uh, beyond what you could imagine at times is, is amazing. 
just I'm I can't stop just grinning ear to ear. It's so nice to listen <laughs> to both of you share your words of wisdom Good. with us. And Very as true. you're saying, there are people out there willing to help. Jerry and Dylan are two of those people. They are yeah. part of our ambassador yeah. team. We have our Help Hope Live staff, our Help Hope Live ambassadors that are here to help. And that's such an important thought and such an important yeah. word to get out there. That is what we are here to do. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank both of you yet again. I'm so lucky to know you and to have this conversation and to work with you on a daily basis. Um, and just, is there any last words? I don't know, Dylan, you look like you have something you want to say before we head out. Well, I just say thank you, Sonny, and thanks to everybody at Help Hope Live for, for you know, making dreams into reality. I mean, it, it's uh, and facilitating that. That's that's really noble work. And thank you for being a part of that. And 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 again, yeah, just echo that hope out to, to everybody out there. Um, you know, I, Jerry and I are examples of like uh, hope that's beyond what we could have imagined. I don't think we could have possibly you know, strung together in our thoughts, what, what our, our lives could look like. And, um, but we had the guts to, to keep going, as Jerry said, you know, and, um, uh, so just, yeah, it, it encourage it, please reach out if, you know, to, to us or anybody, uh, that you can think of to have questions, please don't be afraid, uh, to fight for your own life. And, uh, you know, we, we want to join you in that fight. And Jerry, would your younger self, that 11 year old that got put on that, uh, that sports team ever think that you'd be 67 sitting here today? No, my father used to talk about, um, you know, and I was like 28 or so he'd say, you know, they do transplants now. And I'd be like, I'll never get one of those. <laughs> and I never thought I, I never thought I would make it till my 40th birthday. So yeah. Yeah, I've been blessed. I'm here. And, you know, especially after my liver and kidney, I never thought I was getting through that. I mean, I didn't lose hope, but, you know, I was a realist. Yeah. And, um, yeah. but I went into it fighting and thinking all the great things I would do afterward. But no, I never thought I would be here. Um, but I have a great support system. I have great family, friends, my teams many teams of doctors have been mm -hmm. phenomenal mm -hmm. and you know organizations like help hope live i mean yeah the support and how they uh you know they make it easier and that's yeah. the most important yeah. thing when you're in a stressful situation and you know you don't want to have to worry about the financial issues right. and that's 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 stress kills yeah, yeah. so yeah. i'm very thankful to uh everybody at help hope live Thank you. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'm again thankful to both of you. Thankful for everyone who is watching. And as we close this out, let us dare to hope to live yeah. in the forward as we go fill up our life buckets. Yeah, not that's our right. bucket lists, but our life yep. buckets. Our All right, lists. Jerry. That's right. All right. There that's you go. Right. Sounds Woo! good. Right. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And please, if you have any questions, reach out at helphopelive.org. We are here to help. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Awesome. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.